What's up, Joe? What's up, everybody? Today on Sports 360, I'm joined by activist, author, and radio host, Bill Fletcher Jr. Bill joins me to discuss the recent wave of protests here in America and abroad, and the role athletes and others can play in the fight for social justice. It's a terrific conversation on a timely topic, and we're about to bring it to you right now on Sports 360. Joining me today on Sports 360 is Bill Fletcher Jr. Bill is a an activist in both the labor and civil rights movements. Uh, he's an author of several books on labor unions, worker solidarity, the role of black workers in America and around the world. And he's also the host of a radio show called Arise with Bill Fletcher. And he joins me today to talk about the intersection of activism and the role that athletes play in, uh, in, in that activism. So, Bill, first of all, man, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great, Jeff, and I really, really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this discussion very much. So have I, Bill. So have I. Obviously, there's a lot going on right now um, in the world. Uh, we're still dealing with the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Um, but we're also, in, in the past several weeks, we have seen, you know, the rise of protests in our streets following or sparked by um, the killing of George Floyd. And of course, there's a long history here of, of African-Americans uh, being oppressed and killed by police that also obviously play into this. Um, but what we've also seen, Bill, and why I wanted to have you on the show today is I believe we've seen a rise of athlete activism over the years and particularly now. And so I wanted to talk to you about what's going on in the world and the role of athletes in it. So I've been looking forward to this as well. So I really thank you for coming on today. Sure. Now, now, Bill, let, let's, I, I'd like to start with, you know, as I said at the top, you've been at this for a while. You know, mm -hmm. um, we go back a while, and I think it's fair to say that for our listeners. We've known each other, I don't know, Bill, over 20 years, I would, I would take right. it, going That's back right. to our days at the AFL-CIO. Mm -hmm. But you, you're a longtime activist. Um, can you just give us your view of the protests that we're witnessing here in America and around the world. And for me, Bill, it's it feels different. And I don't know if that's just me. When I say feel different, then, you know, maybe some of the more recent protests, it seems different this time. What's your view on what we're witnessing right now? Well, Jeff, it is different this time. Where it will end remains an open question, but it is different. And the closest analogy I would come to is actually 1919. Um, I know a lot of people have talked about the year 1968. I don't think that's the right analogy. In 1919, the United States, after the end of World War I, was in a depression. There was the outbreak of the so-called Spanish flu, which would be more appropriately termed the American flu since it started in the United States. Um, there was Red Summer, which were these uh, pogroms, racial attacks against black communities around the country. And then it was the Red Scare in which uh, there was repression on uh, radicals. And all of these things came together, making 1919 an explosive year. Now, what's interesting, Jeff, is that before 1919, there were a number of things happening. The uh, flu began in 1918. Uh, there had been racial attacks on black communities before. There was repression of radicals before. But it was the coming together of these things at the same time that really triggered what we saw in 1919. And I would argue is very similar to today, that 
we have been seeing these increasing protests around uh, police brutality. Um, the, the protests, you know, go back, frankly, until the 19th century. But, in, you know, since, since the Ferguson uprising and others, we've seen these protests and they slowly died down. And then what happens now is the convergence of several things. COVID-19, the economic collapse, the uh, three lynchings of black folks in a row within a matter of weeks, and the, um, uh, the environmental crisis. So you put all of these things together and it becomes sort of like critical mass in a, in a nuclear explosion. The uranium being fired at each other at a certain velocity and by itself, each packet of uranium would not blow up, but coming together, it's va boom. And that's what makes this very different. Now, added to that, of course, is the incendiary factor of Donald Trump, who has done something really remarkable by U.S. history standards. He hasn't even gone through the pretense of calling for national unity or any semblance of the recognition of the pain that black America has been going through, that other peoples of color who've been victims of uh, police violence have been going through. He has been fanning the flame. And so that's made this an even more intense period. And Bill, you know, when, when we look at that, and, and on that last point, I couldn't agree more. Um, there has been a lack of leadership, you know, from from the White House here. Um, and that's being kind to say it's been a lack of leadership. Um, but we have seen, you know, the protests in the streets, not just here in, in the United States, but around the world. We've seen other countries protesting um, mm-hmm. after the, the, the killing of, of, of George Floyd. Uh, okay. But here in the United States, one of the things that you know, I believe has been something that we have to take note of is, and there's a number of things, Bill, but I, I want to start here, is the number of young people that are on the street, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, you know, I you, you see them, you see they're front and center. And, you know, there is this general s- sense of enough is enough, but there's also this, this heightened awareness, um, you know, among our young people. What do you make of that? That in and of itself is not unusual, Jeff. Um, if, you, if you think back at uh, Birmingham 1963 and the, 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 the mass movement that was there, if you think about uh, what was happening in the streets of the U.S. in 67, 68, it's young people um, or younger people. Uh, and I don't think that is unique. What is different, though, is that this has been far more multiracial. And I'm not talking about the right-wing provocateurs. I'm talking about people who are legitimately protesting, um, far more multiracial than I can remember. And um, at this level of protest for this length of time, I don't mean for just one massive DC demonstration. But the other thing that you mentioned in passing is the international aspect. And I think that what we have to understand about this is that the explosion in the United States has resonated with people around the world. It's resonated in Palestine and London. It's resonated in Paris and in Germany. Um, It's been interesting that there haven't been more protests in Africa, but that's, uh, I'm not sure what to make of that just yet. But what, what we do see is uh, two things uh, playing out. One is an, a genuine act of solidarity by people that, that see the criminality of what we're facing here. But the other thing that we're seeing is the identification with the Black American experience. And I don't mean that in some hokey way. What I mean is that it raises issues of race and inequality uh, around the world. 
And inequality is not just wealth, but it includes wealth. It includes populations that have been marginalized. It includes the treatment of um, African and Asian immigrant populations in Europe. Um, it, 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 it touches uh, people in London who have their own set of issues with the police. Um, and you can go on and on so that this, it, it's like a bell rang. And people around the world that have faced various forms of racial and national oppression, people that have been looking at the growing inequality that's accompanied the way the economic system has been operating, particularly for the last 40 years, to use your words, people were saying enough is enough. And among those people, Bill, and, and this is, you know, I really do want to talk about the intersection of sports and activism today. Mm -hmm. uh, among those people are athletes, right? And yeah. that's not unusual either, as you talked about, you know, with as mm -hmm. it relates to young people. You know, we have had athletes who have been activists, um, you know, throughout the history of sports. I mean, you know, I, just in my lifetime, you know, people like Arthur Ashe, you know, I remember mm -hmm. that, um, you know, Muhammad Ali, obviously. And then we've had others, you know, Bill Russell, Jackie Robinson, Billie Jean King, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. More recently, the Williams sisters, uh, Venus and Serena, um, mm -hmm. U.S. women's soccer team, and of course, Colin Kaepernick. Um, so there, there's a history here of athlete activism. But right now, Bill, athletes seem to have a greater voice. Some of that mm -hmm. sh certainly can be attributed to social media and, you know, the ease of getting their message out and athletes speaking broadly to the population. But is that the only thing that's going on here, in your opinion? Is it just because athletes have more access or are we seeing more awareness, more education, more sensitivity? That's a really interesting question. I think that there are a number of things playing out. As you mentioned, there is a long history of athletes speaking up or setting an example, um, usually in response to some sort of movement, but not always. Um, but I, I mean, so for me, in becoming radical, which I, I started to turn towards radicalism when I was 13 in 1967, in the 1968 Olympics, the example of John Carlos and Tommy Smith, my God, mm. it wasn't, I mean, like for so many of us, it was the source of inspiration. You, you know, in fact, I, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever told you this, man. A number of years back, I met John Carlos. I was at some event in California. And I went up to him and I just put out my hand and I said, brother, I want to thank you. You know, I want to thank you for the inspiration that you set for me and for so many other people. And I really meant it. You know, I was just really taken. So, yes, on the one hand, we've had athletes. The other thing that we've generally had is a counterattack on athletes um, when they speak up around injustice, that frequently athletes are told, you know, shut up and just go do your sport. You know, whether it's playing football, running track, or, or, or playing baseball or whatever. Um, and, you know, be a model for your people. Uh, what's different this time is represented in some ways by the Goodell apology, that the upsurge and the intensity of the upsurge and the blatant <clears throat> example of the criminality in these three lynchings uh, that, you know, included um, the George Floyd murder changed something so that it's not simply that you have athletes speaking up, but that the counterattack is much weaker. And you have, like, like we are talking about, the, the Goodell apology, or you have uh, the Drew Brees controversy and 
and his not only retracting what he said, but then articulating a new message and, and in fact telling Trump basically to shut up on his flag stuff and focus on the real issues that are at stake. And, and this, is, this is really, really amazing. How long it will last is a, is a very big question. And this is where I start to worry because as someone who has studied history, one of the things that you see over time is that you'll see these very progressive upsurges that are then followed by a counterattack by the forces of wealth and property and conservatism, where they try to snatch back everything that we've won, snatch back the initiatives that we gained. And this is one of the reasons that organization becomes very important, Jeff, that relying on spontaneous upsurges, whether among masses of people or in sports, is a recipe for a very big problem. Bill, you said so much there, um, and, I, and I hope we'll be able to touch on all of it. But that last point in particular, I'm so glad you mentioned that because over the past week or so, as I have, uh, as millions of others, have taken part in, you know, you know, whether it's protests or vigils or any types of gatherings where people are coming together saying enough is enough in various ways, or just witnessing it, you know, uh, on the television and other reporting, one of the questions that has been in my mind, Bill, is where is the leadership? And, you know, part of me, you know, is thinking that the leadership will rise, right? That there are going to be some men and women who will step to the forefront. And perhaps mm -hmm. that will be the case. But that has concerned me. So I'm glad you hit on that point. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that is critical, that there needs to be leadership in order to, to formulate message and strategy and, and for there to be some real sustainability to what we're seeing right now. So you're, you're pointing to what is the Achilles heel of so many spontaneous movements. So on the one hand, Jeff, there is leadership in the sense that at the local level, there are leaders with a small L. There are people that have followings that are engaging people, bringing people out to protest and stuff like that. But in the absence of organization that links those leaders, that's when you end up having the recipe for defeat. And, and so one of the difficulties historically is that people uh, all too often look for the great leader with a capital T and a capital G and a capital L. Um, they're looking for one person, or maybe if we're generous, two people that will emerge and capture the imagination of everybody. Very rarely does that happen. What does happen is if there is organization in advance of an upsurge, that organization can take advantage, and I mean that not in an opportunistic sense, but that organization can take advantage of the upsurge as a way of moving things forward. When there is no organization in advance of an upsurge, it becomes incumbent that something be put together. And one of the things that I have been arguing uh, for the last uh, week or so, strenuously, anytime I get a soapbox, is that we need right now a broad-based people's anti-repression coalition we need a, that has basically four demands. One is no troops in our cities. A second is uh, demilitarize the police. A third is justice for the people who have been lynched. And a fourth is anti-austerity. And, and that basically we need a broad movement that takes demands like these as a way of channeling the energy that's been coming out of the street. And there are organizations that are out there. Some are old and some are new. 
you know, the movement for black lives is part of it. But this is not just a black thing, Jeff. Um, I mean, for example, one of the things that has not been discussed is that the disproportionate number of, uh, disproportionately, Native Americans are the greatest victims of police violence. In, mm. the, in, the, in the aftermath of the Floyd killing, I don't know more than one news outlet that has made mention of that. And, um, and so, you know, you, you know, we're living also in a time when Trump, in the midst of the COVID crisis, has played on anti-Asian racism. And Asians are being attacked all over this country. Um, we are in a point where, in the midst of this economic collapse, uh, the Republicans are basically saying there'll be no further bailouts. Basically, y'all are going to starve. That's the message. And when you have the, the, the intensity of basically being trapped at home, running out of money, running out of food, you're going to have an explosion. Uh, and it could be even more of a disaster. And so this is a time for organization that brings together, weaves together these issues that, that are already there. People, people recognize them, but we need a clearer storyline. And that's one of the places that organization should be to play a major role. And we need it right now. Um, I, 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 you know, there's historic examples like Italy in 1919. Massive worker uprisings, strikes all over the country, uh, so much so that the Italian ruling class thought that uh, socialism was about to arrive in Italy. But there was a lack of overall leadership of this uprising. It was very spontaneous. And as it declined, the force that grew was Mussolini in a fashion. And they basically took advantage of the decline of the movement in order to assert themselves. We have to make sure that nothing comparable happens because there are right-wing forces, some of which are armed, that are waiting. They want to make use of mass movements and what they perceive as chaos in order to incite what they call boogaloo or a racial civil war. And, and so organization organization is is our salvation and bill in in staying on this point do you see a role for athletes given especially in this country but also around the world given you know the high profile that they have and the followings that they have you know you mentioned for example uh, Roger Goodell statement mm -hmm. A statement that was prompted by several NFL players releasing a video saying they wanted the NFL to admit it, it was wrong in, in not supporting the peaceful protests of players and other things. And many of the things in Goodell's statement really parroted what those players said in the video right. a day or two before. And then you also mentioned Drew Brees, who mm -hmm. initially made that whole you know, link between kneeling and the flag and the military and, you know, so-called disrespecting of both of those. And you had players who immediately shot him down, teammates and others, LeBron James, um, who immediately shot him down. And this is a star player, right, who's been around for a long time. And as you said, not only did he apologize but he then, you know, made some acknowledgments of, you know, he, he was wrong. And even mm -hmm. when Trump said Bree shouldn't apologize, as you mentioned, he pushed back on Trump. So we do see the, you know, the influence that athletes have. So where do athletes fit into all of this uh, in your view? Um, in several different ways. Um, so one of the things that, Athletes, I think about uh, people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who has made incredibly good use uh, of the media uh, over the years to help to break down in 
terms for regular people to get, you know, some of the most important issues of our time. And he gets that kind of attention. Um, and so athletes have to understand that there is a certain kind of attention that they can get. But there's a few, a few things, uh, cautionary notes here. One is that they have to be ready for pushback, repression. And, uh, you know, when I think about what happened when Colin Kaepernick spoke up, and it wasn't like the masses of football players joined in support of him. Uh, people were worried about what was going to happen to them as individuals. I would say that athletes need organization as much as anyone else. Now, I realize that there are certain things that sports unions can do and other things that they can't do. Um, I spoke with the leader of one particular union who was pointing out to me, he said, Bill, look, you know, we've got people that are prepared to support folks like Colin Kaepernick, but we have other people who are, you know, Trump folks within our ranks. And I get that, right? My, my answer to that, though, my response to that is that on the one hand, I think that all of these sports unions need to be having internal educationals about racial justice. All of them. Um, and they need to educate their leadership and their membership about what's going on. The second thing I think that's necessary is actually an organization of progressive athletes. Because people standing alone, um, it, it's easy to get whacked. And whacking can be physical or it can be job-wise or any number of other things. It's very different when you're not standing alone. I, I'll give you an example. It has nothing to do with sports. Um, what was it? Last year, um, year before, there was this um, uh, African-American um, who, a professor who spoke out on Palestine. I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, but he spoke out on Palestine, and there was this tremendous pushback, and he was, you know, knocked off of uh, a TV show that, uh, where he had been uh, a commentator, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the problems is that, you know, his statements on Palestine were very good, but he was standing in isolation. He was very vulnerable. And I think that too many people uh, downplay organization and fail to recognize the vulnerability of, of stepping forward as an individual. In fact, Jeff, with all due respect to Colin Kaepernick, this is my criticism of him. I think that it, what he did was courageous. What would have been even better would have been if Colin had organized other players to join with him and or when he started kneeling and was getting a public support, if that public support had been organized so that it wasn't simply people saying on Facebook or Twitter, we support you, but people literally and figuratively standing together. So I think that there's an amazing amount that athletes can do right now, but they've got to Think about it as let's do something together as opposed to I'm personally going to do it on my own. That That's fantastic advice, um, not only for athletes, but, you know, more more generally as well. Um, hey, Bill, let, let me ask you a question in, about a particular sport right now, one that I know you have tremendous interest in, and that's, mm -hmm. and that's baseball, Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. I know you're a baseball mm -hmm. fan. Mm -hmm. um, right now, you, you know, we see, you know, Major League Baseball and its players going back and forth, negotiating, arguing, bickering. You choose your word <laughs> there um, in trying to get back on the field to play. 
at a time when the world is in upheaval, right? Um, uh, it, it's not a good look, in my opinion. I think a lot of people share that. Um, when when you look at that, you know, um, you, you know that kind of thing going on right now, or you look at some some sports teams, like for example, my beloved New York Knicks. Mm -hmm. They refuse to make a statement. And there's been other teams that have not come out. And we could talk about the value of statements standing alone. And we know that we need more. But there's some value, right, in Mm -hmm. lending your voice to the cause, so to speak. And we've had teams like the Knicks and others not speaking out. What kind of effect does that have, Bill? I mean, when we see that, when we see MLB and its players squabbling at a time like this, when the world is, you know, in some places on fire. Um, and then you see some other teams standing on the sidelines. Um, is that, is there something that we should try to do about that? Or do mm-hmm. we just chalk it up as well? Everyone is not going to get it. I want to divide this question into two, Jeff. Um, I, I was actually hoping you were going to ask something like this. Uh, the, so first, I think, every team and every organization in sports needs to be speaking up in this time. Some of the statements may be stronger than others, but when you see the kind of lynchings that we've seen and history of it, it it really is simply time to speak up. And yes, it will be controversial, but, you know, that's okay. Um, But the other part of the question, at the risk of kicking off the MLBPA, I think that, you know, if, if Tony Clark had called me and said, how do you think we should play this, Bill? I, this whole situation that, that the, uh, the players are facing, I would have suggested that, one, the battle that they're having with the MLB should have been framed from the beginning and very consistently in the context of the COVID crisis um, and not about what money we're going to take and not take. Um, and what cuts we're going to accept. But in terms of some very basic things, the players are the ones that are making themselves potentially vulnerable to this plague. They are the ones taking the risk. The owners aren't taking a risk at all. Um, The players, the, the umpires, the people working in the stadiums, deserve to be respected. And that respect includes personal protective equipment. It it involves the right kind of social distancing, and it involves compensation that is appropriate to the risk that they're taking. Jeff, when you frame it like that, it is a very different matter than just saying, I'm not taking another cut. The other thing is that I really don't think the MLB, uh, MLBPA has spoken up the way that they need to about the minor leagues. You know, you, you know when you have minor league players that are making uh, maybe 12, 13 grand a year, who now are, there is going to be no minor league season, um, and you're going to have, uh, you had teams that were, threatening not to pay them anything. Um, And now they may get by and they'll have some unemployment. Uh, But basically, people's careers are on hold. Uh, You know, the elimination of all those rounds of the draft. You know, I just feel like the MLBPA comes across differently when they speak up for justice for the industry the people that make the industry, the players, not just major league players, then they do when they allow themselves to be put in a box where they look like 
They're just looking out for themselves. And what's interesting to me is in, in looking at the press, despite mistakes that I believe the MLBPA has made, they're still getting some good press. But I don't think that they're getting the kind of support that they need, in part because they are falling into the trap that the owners set for them. They set it in football of portraying these disputes as millionaires versus billionaires, rather than that this is a fight around justice. And this then dovetails, Jeff, with speaking out about what's happening around this country. You know, it's like the, 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 the circumstances facing the minor leaguers is very much linked to the situation facing, what, 40 million other workers in this country who are losing their jobs. And so we need organizations like the MLBPA to be speaking out about this. And that changes the dynamics. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. Um, and the one thing I will add, and you, you know, and people who listen to the show know, you know, my connection to the MLBPA. So they may view this as biased, but it's not because it's, this is just part. I think it needs to be part of the discussion because it's it's actually part of the reality is I think a lot of it, Bill, what you're saying is absolutely right. And I think that some of it, some of the problem here for, for the union, I think has been perhaps in messaging or maybe an, an emphasis because, for example, there have been some things that the union has done on behalf of minor league players, right? Um, mm-hmm. They have made sure that certain money has gone to players in the minor leagues. Um, even those who aren't on a roster, right? Because there's some major league players who are also in, in in the minor leagues. But but more than that, getting to your point about you know speaking about the um, you know this in terms of justice, in terms of the vulnerability of players uh, and the risk, not just of players, but all those who are going to be involved directly in the delivery of sport here, of of being fairly treated, right, and respected. That's been part of the messaging, but it, I, I agree with you. It hasn't been to the forefront. Um, but so I do think it's something that's in play, uh, whether it's, it sounds like what you're saying is, but it, it shouldn't just be in play. That should be the focal point, the message, the clarion call, so to speak. Right. Yes, I think that that's right. I think that that's absolutely right. And nothing in what I've said was to demean things sure. that the MLBPA has done. Um, but I think, you, you know, the way I think about it is by analogy. When the Chicago Teachers Union uh, carried out its first strike, the strike against Rahm Emanuel, uh, one of the things that they did, which was really remarkable, was that in laying the foundation for their fight, they went to the parents. And they basically built an alliance with the parents and they developed a series of demands such that the, um, the strike that they undertook was perceived as a strike on behalf of the kids, not a strike on behalf of the teachers. And they kicked the rear end of Ram Emanuel. Not enough of our unions take that approach. The, the term that's often used now is bargaining for the common good. Um, we need our, our organizations to be doing that. And so uh, whether it's the uh, MLBPA and their approach to what's happening in baseball, or whether it's um, all of the, the, the sports unions addressing what's going on out there in the streets. I mean, when I was saying before about, you know, having internal education about racial justice, unfortunately, what happens all too often, Jeff, in when there are these explosions, is that you'll have a round of, oh, we really have to talk about race, by which people mean much more, how do we get along? 
as opposed to let's really talk about race and racism. What is it as a system? What does it mean? Not just in terms of the words that you use, the pronouns or whatever, but how does it work as a system? And I, I think that all of the sports unions need to be engaged in developing racial justice education programs. You know, a number of, a couple of years ago, I worked with the Washington State Labor Council to do just that. The council passed at one of their conventions a resolution to undertake, you know, real education around race and racial uh, injustice. And we worked on developing a program uh, that could be used by the union movement. I would suggest that the sports union should do the same thing. Because uh, otherwise, it's just going to be, you know, the kind of touchy-feely, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, I'll taste your food, you taste mine, and we'll sing Kumbaya, you right. know. And that goes nowhere. Right. Bill, I mean, we could talk for a long time here. Um, but let me ask you this question and, and sure. sort of bring this a maybe closer to home for a lot of people. You know, in recent weeks, I've had many conversations, as I'm sure others have had, with people who want to know what to do, right? Um, They're looking Mm -hmm. for guidance. Um, They're looking for suggestions, answers, um, because they want to be involved, right? Um, Obviously, there's some people who who have taken to the streets. Others, for a variety of reasons, may not do it. I mean, for example, there may be some people who say, you know what, given the current state of the pandemic and my personal situation, I'm not going to be in a gathering like that, right? But I still want to be involved. Um, And even just more broadly, Bill, um, how, you know, for, for people who are seeking a way to be involved, what kind of advice would you give to them? Um, and obviously, this is a, a general question, but I think, you know, I'm sure you'll give some applicability to a lot of people in various situations. But what kind of advice would you give to people who say, you know what, I, you know, they do feel enough is enough and they want to be a part of effectuating change? No, I'm glad you asked this question, too. Um, so I haven't gone to the protest, Jeff, um, and I haven't gone to the protest for two reasons. One is I can't run as fast as I used to, you know, (laughs) just to be blunt. That's right. I hear that. That's right. right? And it's like when I look at what some of these cops have been doing, well, when I was in my 20s or 30s, I could run. I could outrun them. Um, But now, you know, that's some knee issues and stuff like that. I can't run as fast. And that's one issue. The other issue is COVID-19. You know, I mean, I'm at an age where I am vulnerable. And, um, and so I made a decision. My contribution was going to be elsewhere. And my contribution has been through writing, uh, through developing trainings, like I was just talking about, uh, for organizations and for unions. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's, that's me. And, and, and Jeff, I don't feel any guilt about it. Yeah, on one level, I'd love to be out there, but, you know, I, I, I think that this is the right, the right move. I think that people have to decide for themselves what their comfort level is. So some people may decide, the heck with it, I'm going to go to the demo, even though I might get COVID. And that's between them and God. That's not up to me to comment on. That's up, that's up to them. The, um, but there are other things that people can do. So, for example, over the last number of weeks, there have been a lot of very creative protests uh, that pay attention to social distancing. Car caravans. In the city of Oakland, I think that there was a car caravan of about 1,000 cars. And, and to, you know, to, to raise awareness around a variety of issues. So there are tactically things that people can do that are safer. Another thing that is incredibly important is to make use of mainstream media and social media in order to create um, a reverberation 
right? There needs to be echoes. We, people, people need to know that protesters and others that are fighting for social justice need to know that they're not alone. And every letter to the editor, every op-ed, every call into a talk show where people say, I'm with the protesters, makes a hell of a big difference so that people don't feel isolated, don't feel like they're on their own, don't feel like uh, you know, they're on some sort of suicide operation. So there are different things that they can do. The other thing, frankly, is something I tell my mother, who is 92 years old, and frequently we you know, talk and she'll complain about not being able to do things the way she once could. And, and I've said to her, Mom, there is something you can do. You can write a check. Hmm. There are organizations out there that desperately need resources. You know, all kinds of organizations ranging from the Movement uh, for Black Lives, which is a coalition of groups, to Jobs with Justice, to the Southern Poverty Law Center. I mean, you, you name it. And they could, they could benefit from your contributions. And if all you can do, mom, is write a check, that's invaluable. So there is no excuse. There is always something that someone can do, but you have to decide what your comfort level is and not be guilt tripped. So I don't want someone coming to me and saying, Bill, if you were really serious, you would be out there demonstrating. No, that's not, that's not going to be a winning argument. Um, I may make that decision. I may say that I'm willing to take the risk. But I may also say there's other contributions that I can make that I think are just as valuable. That's some terrific advice because I, I believe that, you know, for some people, there is some guilt that's self inflicted and there's some that may come from others. Um, and at this time, that's not what we need. We just need people being involved in whatever way they can be involved. And I think what you just said is tremendously, tremendously helpful uh, to a lot of people. So I appreciate, certainly appreciate that. Um, Thank you. Bill, like I said, man, this has been a great conversation. Um, I want to say something to you before we close here. Um, something I haven't told you before. Um, but, you know, I just find myself at this stage of life, man, of saying, you know what, uh, you know, you get older, right, Bill, and you, you start to get less concerned about certain things that used to concern you before, right? That's okay. sort of the benefits of getting older, right? Um, but I want to say something to you, man, and one of the, and, and, and it's this, it's how much I appreciate you. You know, I remember when I met you, what probably had to be back in the late 90s when I started working right. for the AFL-CIO. And in a lot of ways, I was like a fish out of water because I'm from New York, born in New York, raised in New York. Didn't know anyone in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. And I took the job at the AFL-CIO shortly after law school. Um, and, you know, I got there and, you know, organized labor, AFL-CIO, right? You know, in, affecting labor policy in the country and around the world. So it's a big job, uh, a lot of talented people. And, you know, I'm commuting back and forth between New York and DC for about six weeks. You know, I have to situate my family, had a lot of things going on and trying to now learn my way around this, you know, this large organization. And I want to tell you something, brother. I watched you. I watched you. I watched how you handled yourself, how you spoke, how you dealt in various situations. And you had spoken earlier about, you know, John Carlos and how he inspired you. But I just want you to know, you know, we don't have to stand on an Olympic stand or have a, a the broadest platform in the world to inspire other people. And I want you to know you've been you inspired me and I learned things through observation. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to make sure I told you that and, you know, not spoke about it at some point later. You know what I mean? When Thank perhaps you. it wouldn't have as much meaning for you. So um, I appreciate you coming on the show, Bill. But more than that, man, I appreciate you, period. And I just wanted thank to you. let you know that. Jeff, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I am. That makes my day. And. Um, yeah, it, it makes my day because. 
it's rough out there. And um, as you know, and, you know, when you speak up on different things, it's very easy, as we talked about earlier, to get slapped down, uh, to lose out on opportunities. And it makes a real difference when you hear something like you just said, and I really appreciate that. Thank you well, so much. It's sincere, brother. I mean, and so I, I, I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you uh, today. So, um, well, listen, Bill, uh, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to believe right now that, you know, this is not a short lived, you know, movement, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, and I think we'll be here for a while. And so, you know, to that extent, um, I hope you will remain open to come back if, you know, to discuss different things as they as they arise, because I really appreciate your informed perspective. So hopefully you'll be Absolutely. open to do that. Anytime, anytime. I love you. I love your podcast. And I, you're a great guy. So I just I would love it. I'd be honored. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I appreciate you, Bill. So thanks for coming on today and joining us on Sports 360.